The title of the lecture, The Revival of the Austrian School, Mises and Rothbard, is uh, slightly inaccurate because what I'm really going to do, I'm going to get to that, but um, I'm going to finish up more or less um, from yesterday. So really, this is going to talk m more about the fall and then the revival of the school, okay, and the reasons for the decline. Let me mention, though, before I start, the um, similarities between Mises and Rothbard. Some very interesting similarity, even, similarities, even though they're, they're um, two generations apart. Okay. First of all, I, I consider them the two greatest economists of the 20th century. Um, they were born two generations apart, as I said, and they were worlds apart in their cultural background and in personal temperament. Um, but as I said, there were important similarities. Uh, they were both creative geniuses who constructed um, uh, a breathtaking system of economic theory. Both worked in virtual isolation okay, from mainstream academia during very productive periods of their careers. Rothbard for all of, of his career and Mises for a very productive period of his career in uh, beginning in the late 1930s. Um, or actually beginning after World War II. Uh, f thoroughly, despite their extraordinary mental abilities, both men displayed tremendous intellectual humility. They didn't seek to, build, to, to reinvent the wheel, to rebuild economics from the ground up. Okay? Their ambition was to refine and advance um, and correct the work of their acknowledged masters. Mises always acknowledged Bombavrk as his master, whereas Rothbard always acknowledged Mises as his master. So they, they worked within an existing paradigm and tremendously advanced that paradigm. And both, pub and importantly for us, both published comprehensive treatises on economics at crucial points in the history of economic thought that saved the Austrian school from really disappearing into oblivion. Okay. Mises' treatise in 1989 and Rothbard's treatise, Man, Economy, and State, in 1962. And finally, both were uh, very passionate and intransigent seekers of truth. There was an article written by Mises' friend on Mises, uh, Jacques Rueff, a, a liberal economist, member of the Montpellier Society, uh, and the article was titled, The Intransigence of Ludwig von Mises. Okay. They wouldn't take a step back on principle. Okay. And Rothbard always talked about compromising on means, but never on ends. Um, and they really never deviated from Karl Menger's original vision of economic phenomena as rooted in the valuations and choices of human action. So that, that's sort of an introduction to the types of, of to the two men who, who did save Austrian economics and who were responsi responsible for its, its rebirth. Okay. Now, let me talk about the decline, uh, the fall and the rebirth of Austrian economics. First, I'll give you what, what has come to be the standard account. It's, it's not written down anywhere in detail. Uh, it was an account I accepted myself up until the late 1990s um, when I started rethinking things. It's, you can find it in bits and pieces throughout Israel Kirzner's writing. And recently, Bruce Caldwell's um, biography on Hayek incorporates this view. It's a view that almost everyone who, who was an Austrian in the 1970s and, and, and later accepted pretty much by osmosis. Okay. And um, so I'll call it the Kersner Caldwell account. Um, let me just tell the story according to Kersner and Caldwell. According to, these, to, to, to this view, uh, Austrian economics was riding high. Okay. Um, it was developing tremendously during the 1920s and 1930s. Um, by the early 1930s, it had offered really the only reasonable explanation for the Great Depression. Um, so that while English-speaking economists were saying that, there would n that we were going to live through an era of perpetual prosperity and that the, the business cycles had effectively been abolished in the 1920s because the Fed and the Bank of England, mainly the Fed, had stabilized prices and that therefore without an inflation of consumer prices, you could never have an ensuing depression. Irving Fisher, the, 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 the proto-monetarist and Milton Friedman's um, inspiration, uh, claimed at the end of the 1920s that this was 
the era of perpetual prosperity. And when, when the Great Depression did strike, what occurred was a lack of any explanation for why it should happen. It took many, many people by surprise, both in academia and in business. So the Austrian business cycle theory, which had been developed by Mises and Hayek <clears throat> during the 20s, was ready at hand as an explanation. And it quickly spread its influence um, throughout the continent and to the United States. So according to the Kurzner Caldwell account, the Austrian school was actually flourishing and, and, and gaining even more adherence in the 1930s. Then 1936 struck and we had, quote, the Keynesian avalanche. And the Austrian school disappeared down the memory hole. Okay? It was buried by, by the Keynesian avalanche. Now, one problem with this, and I'll, I'll talk about it in more detail later, is, well, that's only macro. Okay? Certainly the quantity theory, which, had, which was developing at Chicago um, by um, some of Milton Friedman's mentors, uh, including um, Mintz, and Henry Simons, uh, that theory was also buried in 1936. But Chicago microeconomics wasn't buried. Okay? In fact, that continued to flourish. All right, so, that's, so we have the Keynesian avalanche explanation of, of, of why the Austrian school um, fell from its, its, its level of influence and popularity. Okay? So it's up here, and suddenly, in 1936, you know, it reaches its, the nadir of its... Of its, of its existence. Um, it's barely alive. Okay. Um, and then, in this account, there's a big bang theory of its rebirth. Suddenly, someone has a, a good idea. Hey, let's have an Austrian conference in 1974. And uh, um, if you saw The Natural, the movie The Natural is a great movie with Robert Redford on baseball. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not The Natural, the, the, the movie um, Field of Dreams, okay, with Kevin Costner, who's not such a great actor, but the movie was, was decent. Um, in any case, in that movie, um, you had the phrase, if you build it, they will come. Well, this, theory, this, this account tell, can be summed up in the following. If you hold it, they will come. That is, where did all the, the, the 30 participants come from? There was no Austrian school. If the Austrian school was barely alive, there was only you know, a few people writing who had been Mises' students in the 1950s when he came to America, where did the 30 um, graduate students, myself included, and, and young um, uh, faculty members in economics, where did they come from? Why did they, they suddenly appear in this, uh, this small uh, Vermont town just because this conference was being held? Okay? No explanation is given. So in 1974, in the summer, there was, was the South Royalton Conference, and then in October, Frederick Hayek received the Nobel Prize for work that he did in the 1930s, and boom, there's this big bang, and now we have the reborn Austrian school. Okay. Well, in, in a way, I'm, I'm, because I'm, I'm, I'm making this, this story brief, I am caricaturing, um, in, in, to some extent, what they think, but this is basically the story. Now, the problem with this story, um, or the problems with the story, are, are, are many. Um, the first is that it really does not give us any idea, or it attributes no, almost no role to Mises and Hayek in the rebirth, okay? particularly to the books Human Action and Man, Economy, and State. Okay? Human Action is looked on as a, as a book that Mises wrote at the end of his productive career in 1949. And yes, it's a very good book, but it sort of summed up what he had said earlier. And it wasn't very influential. Um, also, it treats the Austrian school as, as really a monolithic entity whose members all agreed with one another. Okay? And this wasn't even true at the beginning, as I've shown you. Wieser and von Bawerk disagreed. Okay? Uh, very profoundly on, on, on basic value and price theory. In, 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 uh, more particularly, it ignores two divergent traditions that grew up right from the beginning of the Austrian school. Okay? Both von Bawerk and Wieser were followers of Menger, but they took divergent paths. Wieser's 
I had a student, uh, Hans Meyer, who tried to develop his thought in a certain direction and, and didn't, do, didn't do very well. Um, and, and, then, and then Hayek followed Wieser. So we had, we, had a, we, we had a tradition, which I, I'll call the general equilibrium tradition in Austrian economics, which was Wieser and also Schumpeter was in this tradition. Wieser, Schumpeter, who was Mises' um, in Mises' cohort, he was in the, in the third generation with Mises, uh, and uh, um, goes from uh, those two, from Wieser and Schumpeter to Hayek, who was in the fourth generation. Okay. On the other hand, um, we have the Bombavert, Mises, Rothbard tradition. And Hayek himself, and if, if you re read my article on uh, the place of Mises' human action in the development of modern economic thought, Hayek himself recognizes the difference in the tradition and talks about uh, how uh, Mises developed the Bombavert line and um, he himself and Hans Meyer tried to develop the, the Wieser line that, that, and that he was very disappointed when he, uh, that the Wieser line didn't develop more and that he admits that in the United States the Bombavert um, Mises line or tradition has dominated. Okay. Um, it also does not deal with the crucial importance of what I talked about yesterday, an institutional framework based on property and resources. Okay. That is that a paradigm needs resources to exist and flourish. You can have geniuses like Mises and Rothbard working in isolation without interaction, much interaction with other minds, developing systems, but most of us are not geniuses. Uh, Mises and Rothbard come around you know, once a century. Also, this, account, this leaves out of account um, Joseph Schumpeter, who was, who, was, who was treated as if, if he was just a Valrasian and wasn't really involved much in Austrian economics. In fact, he was very involved in Austrian economics. Okay. Um, yes, it's true he followed Val Roth, but he also followed Wieser. And his books influenced the general equilibrium tradition in Austrian economics. Finally, it, it portrays Murray Rothbard wrongly as um, becoming, uh, leaving economics sometime in the 1970s and becoming a social philosopher and libertarian activist, okay, and uh, ceasing any contributions to economic theory um, or to Austrian economics in general, okay, and that's, that's completely wrong. Okay, so that is a standard account. Um, now, what I would call the revisionist account Um, disagrees that the Austrian school suddenly, da uh, suddenly was buried under the K Keynesian avalanche in 1936. In fact, I argue, and this account argues, that the um, Austrian school was pretty much um, dead, at least the, the Bombavirk Menger uh, tradition, by, by, by the late 1920s, early 1930s. Okay. Um, let me just mention why this ha how this happened. Okay, uh, by the late 1980s, there was a tremendous flourishing of work. Bombavirk, Wieser, and then many others in Austria um, began writing works in the tradition of Menger. Um, by the 1890s, the uh, Austrian school had become a worldwide entity. Okay, there was it had great international influence uh, in um, U.S. A separate American school grew up. Called the Ameri they called themselves the American Psychological School. Okay. J.B. Clark, Frank Fetter, Herbert J. Davenport. Okay, and let me just sh show you a few pictures of these, these men. Okay, this is Clark, who was working along the lines of, of Menger, but um, wrote that, in fact, one of his main influences was Menger. Okay. And he's known as the father of, of sort of scientific um, American economics or margin utility economics. Uh, here he is with, uh, here's Frank Fetter who taught at Princeton and um, was a follower of Bombavirk and developed Bombavirk's uh, time preference theory of interest into a pure time preference theory uh, and rooted out the, some errors that Bombavirk had in, in his theory. Uh, also was a great rent theorist and wrote a, a, a good principles text which summed up Austrian principles uh, right on the eve of World War II. One, his text came out in, in 19, um, uh, 1915. Uh, and there he is with an older Clark, okay, who he considered to be the leader of the American Psychological School, which was an unfortunate choice. Okay? It was really a praxeological school. It wasn't a psychological school. Um, 
This is it's pretty scary looking. It looks like the Wolfman. But this is Herbert J. Davenport, who um, wrote a number of important treatises and you know was was a, was a subjective value theorist. Uh, wrote a great treatise called uh, which came out in 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 right around World War One, the beginning of World War One, called the Economics of Enterprise, in which he uh, stressed the entrepreneur um, and was was an American Austrian part of the American Psychological School. Uh, unfortunately, as we'll see, this school collapsed because of a tremendous personal animosity between Davenport and Fetter. They continually attacked one another in the journals, not just intellectually, but personally. And they were very close in their thought. Okay? So that was an unfortunate... So they left no students. They left no followers. And then in England, okay, the school, um, as I mentioned, um, Jevons' lone follower, Philip Henry Wicksteed, uh, also um, became a Bombovertian and Mangarian and, and, and brought Austrian economics to, to Great Britain. And there were a few others, uh, Edwin Cannon uh, and William Smart. And, um, well, that's the evil Alfred Marshall, which we'll talk, talk about, um, or who we'll talk about. Okay, so also in the Romance countries, in Italy and France, as we saw, we had uh, the liberal school transforming itself into a marginalist liberal school following Bombavirk. Okay, so... Um, it, it, the, the, the Austrian school became globalized or, or, or became international um, uh, in the 1890s. Okay. Now, what, what, and it, it really reached the peak of its influence by 1914. Okay. There were three great treatises just in England, just in English one by Wicksteed, one by Davenport, and one by Fetter. Okay. And they were thorough treatises um, setting out or presenting Austrian thought up to that point, okay, in the menger bombaver tradition. Okay, what caused the decline of, of, of the Austrian school? First, let's look at very uh, briefly at events in Austria. As I mentioned yesterday, Bombaver went into government service in 1889 after he had finished his three-volume treatise on capital and an interest uh, and stayed there until 1904, okay. He returned to academia in 1905, um, and they created a chair for him at the University of Vienna, but he was very, in Ill, Ill health, and his creative powers had been, had been withered. Okay, um, just to characterize him, um, in other words, he, he, he ceased to become really a player in, in um, Austrian economics at, at that point when he came back. Uh, he couldn't do any, any um, innovative or creative work. Uh, for example, um, somebody, one person described him as to, be, uh, to, to have seemed older than his years suggested. He was only 54 years old when he came back. Okay, he himself, two years after he, he returned to academia, described himself as an old man. Okay, this is what um, all those years in, the Austri in a government bureaucracy can do to you. Um, he had a tremendous workload, and he also tried to keep up his economics at the same time. Um, also, Mises had an interesting comment. He attended... Bombavirk's famous seminar when Bombavirk returned, and um, he, observed, he observed, quote, Bombavirk could have produced much more if conditions had permitted it, but his physical constitution would no longer stand, could no longer stand the hard work necessary to embark upon great works. His nerves were failing him. The two-hour seminar per week already taxed his strength. Okay. So um, Bombavirk was more or less out of the picture when he returned, okay, in 1905, and then he died prematurely in 1914, okay? In the meantime, Menger retired, okay? Menger really stopped writing theoretical articles in the 1890s. His book went out of print. He refused to revise it, but re despite the tremendous demand for his book, he refused to revise it and refused to allow it to be reprinted, okay? Um, it was commanding tremendously high prices uh, in, in used bookstores. It had disappeared from, from the libraries. Um, and yet it wasn't re uh, reprinted until after his death by his son. Okay. So that book wasn't around. Um, they created a chair, or they, 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 they gave the chair to Wieser. Okay, Menger's chair was given to Wieser as the main professor at the University of, of Vienna, who would, the person who would teach all incoming students economics. Okay, because as I said, von Bavark was in government service at the time. Uh, as, we, as I pointed out yesterday, or not in too much detail, but you know, Wieser did not follow Menger's causal realistic approach to economic theory, trying to find out the, the causes of real economic phenomena, of real prices that we observe every day. That was not what Wieser did. He gave us a, 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 a huge general equilibrium system, describing how prices would be if everything was pretty much adjusted. 
okay? That is, how prices would be in a never-never land where there's no changes in the data and so on. Okay, he didn't use math, and he tried to make it more realistic than the Volrasian mathematical system, but it was still a general equilibrium system. He also published uh, the first treatise, complete treatise on economics in Austria, okay, in 1914, called Social Economics. Okay. Um, then in 1903 or 1904, Schumpeter enrolled in the University of Vienna, okay, Joseph Schumpeter, uh, who was a, a brilliant man, famous economist, uh, and he became Wieser's student, but he was also a follower of Walras, um, though he didn't know much math, okay, he thought Walras was the, the greatest e economist who had ever lived. He wrote two books at very young ages. In 1908, he wrote a book on the um, nature and essence of Austrian economics, uh, I'm sorry, of, uh, ec of economic theory. And then in 1911, he wrote a book on business cycles, a theory of, of economic development, and that established an international reputation. So in the third generation, it was Schumpeter who was seen as the star. Mises, who was von Bavarck's student also, had only published uh, a book in 1912 on, on the theory of money, a great book on the theory of money, but he was seen as, as much narrower than Schumpeter. Schumpeter had, had, had produced a book on, on, on pretty much on methodology, the first book, and the second work on business cycles. So he was seen as, a, as Schumpeter was seen as a system builder and the, um, the, the, the star of the third generation. Now, when the fourth generation enrolled after World War I, that included Hayek, Fritz Machlup, Gottfried Hobbler, Oscar Morgenstern, and so on, um, all of, of these men either went to Great Britain in the 1930s or the United States. Okay, Fritz Machlup taught at Princeton and, and NYU for many years. Uh, Gottfried Hobbler um, taught at Harvard for many years. Morgan Stern uh, also taught at Princeton, um, and so on. Anyway, that, th those people entered the University of Vienna between 1918 and 1921. They studied under Wieser. So... Their first exposure to economic theory was to this other tradition. Okay. Now, um, Hayek says many great things about Wieser. He calls him my revered teacher. You can tell he, that Wieser was the main influence on the early Hayek. There's no doubt about that. You can read Hayek on Hayek. No matter how much the other side argues that that's not true, Bruce Caldwell, Israel Kersner, it is true. Okay. In fact, um, you were not allowed to uh, join Mises' private seminar until after you had had your degree, which means after you had had your economics courses at the University of Vienna. Now, it's true that Mises did teach a course at the University of Vienna um, as a private docent, which is someone who uh, is an unpaid lecturer, who the students just give nominal fees to. Um, but um, Hayek himself says he, he, he sat in one day and didn't like Mises' attitude, and so he never, he never completed the course. Okay. Um, but even if he had, Mises did not lecture on general economic theory. That was Wieser's job. Mises lectured on things that were interesting to him, uh, things that he, he was researching on, and, and such as monetary theory, uh, business cycle theory, and so on. Okay. Um, so basically, they also, this generation, was because Schumpeter had gained an international reputation, they read his books, and it had a lot of influence on them. And he was very, very pro Valrasian, very pro general equilibrium. Okay. Um, finally, they did attend Mises' private sem uh, privat seminar after they graduated uh, through the 1920s up to 1934 when Mises left. But by that time, as I mentioned, they had already become economists. Their views had already been formed by Wieser and by reading Schumpeter's books. And in the seminar, what, what they discussed were, were applied topics and, 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 and advanced topics, okay? Um, now, that's not to say that Mises didn't have an, an effect on them. Mises did have an influence on these people. Um, when they read his Socialism, which was published in 1922, um, most of them were social democrats. And almost all of them became much more liberal in, in the European classical sense because of, of, of that book. And, and, and Hayek points out how influential that book was. But again, that was a book on one aspect of economics, okay, socialism. So they were very influenced by Mises' monetary theory and Mises' um, theory of, of, of economic calculation, socialism, and so on. But they were looking at these works through the lens of equilibrium theorists because of their early training. Okay, now, that's one reason for the Austrian school, or at least the Mengarian, Bombavirkian part of the school dying out. 
Second reason is, in the rest of the world, there were, were various factors operating, which I'll, 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 I'll go through pretty quickly. Um, Alfred Marshall um, wrote a very famous, one of the most famous treatises of the 19th century on economics, Principles of Economics, in 1890. Um, by 1910 or so, that book had swept all of England. Okay, So the few Austrians that were in England were pretty much uh, marginalized or pushed to the side. Uh, Wicksteed didn't have an academic position. He also was a preacher and wrote on, on um, religion and so on. And um, so he wasn't, a, he, his, his treatise was swept aside. Okay, uh, The treatise which he wrote in 1911 was, was more or less forgotten about. By 1920, everybody in England was a Marshallian economist except for one school, the London School of Economics, where um, Lord Robbins, Lionel Robbins, later to become Lord Robbins, um, had read a lot of New German and read a lot of the Austrian literature, was very influenced by the Austrians, was also very influenced by Wicksteed's book. Okay? So there's one outpost that remained in Great Britain okay, after the, the, the Marshallian uh, dominance. And um, I'll, I'll talk about what happened there in, in a minute. But in the U.S., uh, we had the fight between the, you know, Fetter and Davenport, they never really went on to, to, to found the school. Okay, uh, By the 1920s, they were old men. They st ceased to contribute to economic theory. Um, and there was a big gap in economic theory. So what happened? M <coughs> Marshallian economics was imported. And the, th the, the vacuum in economic theory was filled by Frank Kausig, who, who was sort of a Ricardian, uh, Mill, and, 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 uh, and a Marshallian. They called Kausig the American Marshall because his brand of, of, of sort of neoclassical, a combination of some marginal utility and the old classical school, his brand really dominated uh, American economics. Um, in France and Italy, I mentioned be, uh, yesterday that the Austrian marginalist school uh, was eventually replaced by a combination of, of Marshall with some German historicism. Okay? So, so it, it, Austrian economics died out in the 1920s with, with, in, throughout the world. Okay? Um, then you had the emigration of Hayek from Austria to the London School of Economics. He was invited there by, by Lord Robbins, who was the chairman of the department. And um, he gave lectures in 1930, lectures which later became published as his great book, uh, Prices and Production, which was a, a, an advance in Mises' um, um, business cycle theory. Uh, but what happened was that when he arrived at the London School of Economics. He met a brilliant student of Robbins, John Hicks, okay, who was one of the fathers of, of sort of modern neoclassical economics. And for, for whatever reason, he influenced Hicks to reread Vilfredo, Vilfredo Pareto, who was, who was a follower of Val, Val Ross and who was a mathematical general equilibrium theorist. The, in the English speaking world, there was no ma mathematical general equilibrium theory. Okay? That was, it was, it was some in Italy and France and so on. But now in the 1930s, for the first time, this, this, new, this new theoretical system was introduced. Okay? And it was introduced by, through Hayek's influence. Okay? Um, so Hicks read the book and, and wrote a, a book uh, uh, called Value and Capital, which came out in 1939. But he was working on it throughout the 30s. It was a very influential book. And what it did was to introduce general equi equilibrium analysis into um, the English-speaking world. Okay. Uh, now, Robbins, who was uh, an Austrian and who had read Mises and who had read Striegel, who was, who was also a follower of von Bauwerk and, and others in German, ha happened to have a personality flaw. Um, in the beginning, he, he was under the influence of Hayek very strongly okay, in macroeconomics. By, after Keynes's book uh, came out, The General Theory, 1936, uh, he quickly changed his mind and became a sort of a quasi-Keynesian. Okay? And he had written a great book explaining the Great Depression using the Austrian business cycle theory, which is simply called the Great Depression. And in his autobiography, written in the 1970s, he apologizes for writing that book and says that he couldn't even stand to re read it through again okay, in preparing for his, his autobiography. He, so Hayek once, I heard Hayek speak once, and, and, and Hayek said that, that Robbins was very, very influenced by... The, the strong opinions held by those around him. So many, since everyone in England was becoming a Keynesian, 
he became a Keynesian. Well, the same thing was true, though, which people don't realize, of his price theory, his microeconomic theory. Okay, he was initially a Mengarian. If you look at his great book on the nature and significance of economic science, um, it's, 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 it's really straight Menger and, and, and early Mises and so on. Um, the methodology is very proxiological. Uh, but because Hicks began to write this book, and, and Hicks was a brilliant man, and Hayek also was thinking in terms of, of general equilibrium, Robbins began to forget about his Mengarian, Bomberverkian um, roots and to move to that side of the tradition. And if you look at his reading list um, for his course in general economic theory, you see this occur you see you know this, this occurring pr very clearly between 1934 or so and, and 1938. Um, let me so in his 1934 1935 session, his syllabus included uh, under the heading Modern Works in General Theory. He had listed treatises by Bombaver, Wicksteed, Fetter, Clark, and Davenport, all Austrians, all hardcore Austrians. Okay. Um, and he did have, alongside that, he had a few uh, works of C Cassell, Pareto, um, who were general equilibrium theorists. But the main works were Austrian um, Bombaverkian works. Okay. However, he did write in the note, this is, he's already, you know, it's, it's already 1934, 1935, Hayek's been there for a while, Hicks is, is thinking in terms of general equilibrium. He appends a note to a syllabus in which he says, the treatment will be non-mathematical in character. Students who wish to witness the same problems treated mathematically should attend course number 66, Introduction to Mathematical Economics. So evidently by that time, he really saw the two theories as being really comp um, just different ways of expressing the same concepts. Okay? Then, things got even worse in the syllabus for 1938-39. Um, he, he moved further away from the Mengarian tradition. He got rid of uh, the, the, uh, the general theory heading and he put statics and comparative statics. Statics meaning you know, general equilibrium theory. And um, no longer were there listed the great treatises by Clark, Fetter, and Davenport, okay? or, or Bombaver. Okay? He kept Pareto's treatise, mathematical treatise, and then he added Hicks and Allen's article on a reconsideration of the theory of, of value, which was the precursor of Hicks's book introducing general equilibrium theory into the um, um, English-speaking world. He also included um, another English economist uh, book called Mathematical Psychics. It's a great title. And, um, and also books by uh, uh, um, Edward Chamberlain, The Theory of Monopolistic Competition, uh, that was also added. And instead of Wicksteed's treatise as being the, the main um, book that, that entering students should read, he listed Knight's Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, which was, was hardly Austrian. Okay? This introduced perfect competition theory. All right, so we see that changing. So the London School of, of Economics okay, lost its Mengarian character in the early 1930s. Okay? Finally, if um, you look at the uh, socialist calculation debate, Okay, that occurred during the mid-1930s. Hayek and Robbins emphasized, and we'll talk about this in, in, in two days from now, they emphasized the difficulty in, 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 in central planning of collecting all this dispersed knowledge and getting it to the planner. They did not emphasize or stress what Mises had stressed, which was the problem of trying to, of monetary calculation or economic calculation, trying to determine from market prices what goods are most de demanded by consumers and what modes of, and what um, um, methods of producing them are the most economic. Okay? This is what Mises stressed. It was not stressed by, by Hayek and Robbins. Okay? Theirs was more of a, a general equilibrium view that there's a lot of information out there that the price system automatically um, communicates to the producers and things are, are, are fairly mechanical. Okay? Though I don't want to say that they are straightforward Valrasian um, General equilibrium theorists. Okay. So, um, the final problem leading to, uh, to the Austrian, final fact leading to the decline of the Austrian school, the death of the Austrian school, was that there was some problems in the actual Austrian theory itself, which ha had been developed up to 1914. Okay. Um, first of all, it really did not clarify the proper use of equilibrium. There is a use for equilibrium in economics, and it was not clarified um, even by the most sophisticated treatises of, of Wicksteed and, and, and Davenport. Okay. 
Sometimes they talked about a moving equilibrium that the market was moving, uh, was, uh, that, that we weren't in a, in, a, in, a, in a, they realized we weren't in a fixed equilibrium, but that equilibrium was moving and the market somehow was chasing it. But, but they, didn't, they didn't make it clear. Um, they also didn't integrate money and price theory. Okay? As Mises says, economics is all about explaining money prices. Where do these money prices that we observe every day come from? The theory of, from Menger forward, the theory was really a barter theory. It was a theory of relative prices. Okay? Money really wasn't integrated into economics. Wick Steve tried in his treatise and partially succeeded, I think. But um, Mises did succeed in 1912 okay, in, in, in his book. But um, that wasn't, he, didn't, he wanted to write a, a full treatment of economics, but was not, not able to. He didn't do that until, until he did human action. And he says himself that my theory was not complete until I wrote um, National Economy, which was the German pre, pre, uh, forerunner of, of um, human action. Okay. So, um, and the third problem was that um, they didn't really stress, enough, the Austrians really didn't, before Mises wrote Human Action, didn't stress the important role of the entrepreneur in forecasting the future and acting as someone who demands present capital goods. Okay? In other words, the entrepreneur is the one who's responsible for the appraisement or for the pricing of, of, of factors of production based on his or her forecasts of what future prices will be. So given these defects, in the 1930s, when general equilibrium theory was introduced in the English-speaking world, economists looked around and said, well, wait a minute. You know, the Austrian theory is simply an unsophisticated, less rigorous version of general equilibrium theory. Okay. It's, you know, it's, it's basically general equilibrium theory, but it's, 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 it's not elegant. It's, um, it's wordy. We can say the same things in, in, just in equations, okay. much more simply, much more clearly. Okay. So because of certain errors in the Austrian theory, which undermined um, or, or obscured the fact that it, was, that, that it was focused on a dynamic, changing, uncertain world, it was just pushed aside because it was inelegant. We can, we can say the same things the Austrians are saying. We can, we can integrate marginal utility by a system of, 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 of simultaneous equations. OK, so that's the way things stood in the 1930s. Now, Mises was extremely productive, continued to write okay, articles, books, and so on through the 19, early 1930s. In fact, in 1933, he came out with a collection of, 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 of his papers that went from 1928 to 1933 on methodology, in which he began to develop the system that came to fruition in human action. And it was at that point, see, that, that, was, that, was, that was already too late for the fourth generation, Hayek's generation, to absorb. Okay? They thought that Mises was saying the same thing in some sense as, um, as, as, as Wieser was saying. They never really realized that Mises had a whole different system in the back of his mind, uh, a, a, a much more dynamic development of Menger and von Bawerk's uh, price theory. So Mises now leaves Austria in 1934. Uh, he, he, remember, he was working uh, for the Chamber of Commerce, which was... Uh, um, an advisory um, body to the uh, Austrian well, legislature. He was working full time in writing all these books, and um, it was a full time job. Okay, and, and still writing books and articles, and still teaching at the university and holding a private seminar. So he's extremely productive. But then when he goes to to Switzerland, to the um, to the uh, Institute of International Relations, I believe. He, Graduate, the Graduate Institute of International Relations, something like that. Okay, he's invited there. He remains there for six years, and he doesn't write very much there. Okay, you're wondering, you know, what's going on. He writes a few book reviews, I think only one academic article. Well, what he's doing is sitting there realizing that Austrian economics has died, that, that Mengarian, the dynamic mengarian bombovirkian approach to price theory is completely gone. And so he decides to reconstruct this theory, solve the problems, and put forth to the world a general treatise. So he sits there for five years, and he does this. And in 1940, okay, you know, and as we know, timing is everything. In 1940, out comes his um, uh, book, National Economy, and um, unfortunately, 
because of the, the outbreak of the war, war World War II. Uh, it can't be distributed in the German-speaking market, and the Swiss publisher goes bankrupt. So the book just disappears. Okay? So it doesn't appear until after World War II when Marshallian economics has, has completely taken over throughout the world with a little bit of Eurasian economics. So if you looked at, 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 at textbooks after World War II in the 1950s, you have 90% of basically Marshall's partial equilibrium analysis, and the other 10% at the end you tell the students, well, all of these markets are really connected, and we can connect them mathematically. And that's what you have. And, no, and then human action comes out, and no one's going to pay attention to human action, I mean, given that view of, of, of things. So, um, but the book is there, and it's important that the book is there, that, that this whole system now has been integrated. Okay. Mises has solved the problems. Uh, so, what happens? In the 1950s, then, Austrian economics is almost completely dead. Um, oh, let me mention, before, uh, before I, I get to that, it's interesting to see Hayek's reaction both to Mises's, both first to the decline of the Austrian school in the 1930s, okay, to the decline of its price theory, and then to Mises's uh, book on um, uh, uh, national economy. Um, first, on page, in my article, I, 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 I give a quote it's on page 57 if you're interested, because it really does show how Hayek's thinking is so much different from Mises. Where Mises was in 1934 sitting around attempting to reconstruct Austrian economics, here's what Hayek said about the fact that Austrian economics as a tradition, as, a, as an independent tradition, disappeared in the 1930s. He's writing this in 1968, looking back. He says, but if this fourth generation, meaning his generation of Austrians, in style of thinking and in interest, interests still shows the Vienna tradition clearly, nonetheless it can hardly any longer be seen as a separate school in the sense of representing particular doctrines. A school has its greatest success when it ceases as such to exist because its leading ideals have become a part of the general dominant thinking. What's the general dominant thinking in the late 1930s? General equilibrium thinking. So he's saying... They've absorbed everything good that the Austrians had. They absorbed the margin utility and so on. And, and the Austrian school disappeared. But this is a triumph for the Austrian school. Okay? Now try to figure that out. The Vienna school has, to a great extent, come to enjoy such a success. Its development has indeed led to a fusion of the thought stemming from Menger with that of Jevons, math, you know, quasi-mathematical, by way of Philip Wicksteed, of Leon Walras, by way of Alfredo Pareto, and especially of the leading ideas of Marshall of Alfred Marshall. So what is he saying? He's saying that the Austrian school has made its mark and it's been combined into this great neoclassical synthesis of Marshall and Walras and all of these guys. Okay? Now tell me that that's, you know, read human action and then see if that's Mises' attitude, okay, where he's continually attacking all of these um, divergent trends. Okay? Now, what does he say about, he's shocked when national economy comes out because I don't think he realized how differently Mises was thinking. So it comes out in 1940, he reviews it um, overall, he likes the book, but here's some interesting things he's, he's perplexed by it. Um, he says, uh, he's perplexed by the fact that Mises had been unaffected by, and I'm quoting Hayek, the general evolution of our subject during the period over which his work extends. In other words, Mises doesn't incorporate imperfect competition theory, doesn't incorporate, uh, you know, Valras, doesn't incorporate Marshall. Um, so he's perplexed by this, okay? Um, he needs a good whack upside the head. Um, and, and, and as he goes on to say, and that the development of Mises' thought during this period, uh, quote, appears to be decidedly autonomous, unquote, meaning it's a terrible way of saying that Mises hasn't read anything and that just wrote this, you know, on his own without, you know, reading the latest literature. Um, and then he says, uh, oh, so why is he confused? He's confused because... He, he, he can't understand, he, he fails to, to, to realize that, me, that this book represented Mises' attempt to autonomously reconstruct a paradigm that could not be reconciled with the general evolution, to use Hayek's term, of economics in the direction of Eurasian, Marshallian combination of which Hayek himself approved. Um, now, particularly revealing is Hayek's prediction that the central part of the book, okay, now, those are the central chapters of human action, those are the sections on monetary calculation, and on prices, okay, which is you know a development of Menger. Um, he says that uh, the central part of the book would not be its main interest to most readers, okay. 
But of course, th th these are the, precisely the sections that contain the reconstructed system. So he likes the praxeology, he likes the subjectivism, but he doesn't like the actual price theory, which is the central part of the book. So th this is my reason for, point, you know, th th this is my revisionist view of why Austrian economics died. Um, sure, the Keynesian revolution had some effect, uh, it, but it destroyed one, one aspect, or, or made people forget one aspect of Austrian economics, and that was the business cycle theory. But one of the reasons for that was that that business cycle theory was based on sort of uh, uh, not very solid foundations. It moved away from a dynamic um, sort of system of pricing, and it was, it was based, Hayek himself, with his books on business cycle theory, even though they were very good, based it on, on Volrasian, on Volrasian um, general equilibrium theory. In one of the books, he says that the highest form that economic theory takes is that of the Lausanne School. The Lausanne School is a school of Volras and, and Pareto. All right, now, so what happens then um, in the 1950s? Well, there's not much being published in the 1950s. Uh, what's going on is that Mises does have a seminar at NYU. He can't get a, he can't get a regular position, though there's some debate about this. Um, so, 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 uh, Pete Becky has seen letters in the archives at the Hoover Institute in which um, they're in the Hayek archives, in which Hayek and, and, and Maklop are exchanging letters. And Maklop is saying, what are we going to do with our problem child, meaning Mises? He keeps turning down all these positions. Okay? Maklop tried to get him a position at Johns Hopkins, but he would have to teach undergraduates, and evidently Mises didn't want to teach undergraduates. Mises wanted a position. There was, a, a, there was something called the um, Institute for uh, Advanced Studies. It's at Princeton University. It still exists. It's where Einstein worked. Uh, it's where Morgenstern and, uh, and, 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 and um, uh, I think Nash worked out game theory. Um, in any case, he would have liked that. It was a research position. Mises would have liked that position. Uh, he reveals that in his memoirs. Okay. Or no, his wife actually reveals that in her, um, in her memoirs of, of, Ludovan, of my life at Ludwig von Mises. She, she, uh, so whether or not he could get, he, could, he, he certainly didn't have, he wasn't flooded with offers okay, because he was perceived as right wing, you know, free market, anti-socialist. Um, so what happens is that a, a, a right-wing foundation begins to pay his salary and gets him a visiting professorship at NYU. Uh, basically, NYU allows him to teach it because, you know, it's free. Okay, they're getting somebody to teach it for free because the foundation is paying his salary. Okay. Um, so what happens is that there's a... A period in the 1950s in which there is a seminar going on. It's going on at NYU. Henry Hazlitt attends it. Um, Murray Rothbard attends it. Israel Kirzner, uh, very bright men. Hans Sendholtz. But not much is, is published during this period. Okay? Hayek has moved out of economics and is writing in social theory um, on the one hand. Um, what we get published, there are a few books. Uh, Hazlitt writes a great book, Smashing Keynesianism, uh, The um, Failure of the New Economics. Um, Rothbard writes a, a great article reconstructing utility and welfare theory. Um, Kersner writes his dissertation under Mises, very good book on the economic point of view, which shows, which deals with the um, history of methodology up to Mises' praxeology. Um, not, not much else is written. Mises does write a, a great treatise on theory and history that comes out in 1956. Okay. But there's a ver ver the books are very few and far between. Um, the school is almost dead. Now, what happens? In 1962, Rothbard comes out with Man, Economy, and State. Okay? And uh, he had been funded to, to publish this book by a, um, a foundation, the Volcker Fund. Um, he lived on these grants, and he began writing the book in the early 1950s, okay, after he had read Human Action. And his initial object is objective is, is to fill in the blanks in, in, in human action, but really to make it a shorter, more accessible book. Okay? He winds up really reconstructing economics once again. Okay? Or uh, let, let me put it differently. He synthesizes economics. Okay? He takes not just Mises, okay, but he takes Fetter, Wicksteed, um, the good things that were written by Robbins, 
uh, and um, uh, I mean, if you if you go uh, a tremendous number of uh, some of Clark's stuff, and he synthesizes all of these American and British economists that were influenced by the Austrians, and he and and, and in particular, he constructs a tremendous theory of production. I take up five chapters of the book, uh, and that theory of production was very very skimpy in Mises. If you look at the Rothbard. Um, uh, letters that he's writing to the, to the people that give him the grants, he mentions that uh, he, he has, to, has to write the production theory himself because there's very little in Mises to guide him. Okay? So he comes up with a, with a, with a, a new synthesis of economic theory uh, squarely within the Menger, Bombavirk, Mises tradition. In fact, Mises himself, for some reason, didn't like the, the structural production analysis that Hayek had, had introduced which came from um, um, Bombaver, okay? And Rothbard reintroduces that. So he combines the pure time preference theory of, of Fetter with the, the structural production theory uh, of Vixel and Hayek, okay? So it's a tremendous work, but he's not done, okay? In 1963, he comes out with the great, America's Great Depression, okay? A book which applies Austrian theory to the um, causes of the Great Depression. Um, he also comes out in 1963 with a short primer. People think it's, it's simply a, you know, an introductory book. A short primer on, on, on monetary theory, what has government done to our, our money. And um, in it, though, he, gi he gives us really for the first time, this is really even missing in Mises, a theory of how fiat money comes into existence. How is it that the tr that we have this transformation from a gold standard through to a, a pure fiat money. Even in human action, Mises says it's not clear whether paper money, the, the previous episodes of paper money, were, were true fiat money. That, in other words, Mises believed that they could have been credit money, meaning that people were always expecting at some point to go back to the gold standard because that always happened. You went off, had paper money during a war or during some sort of crisis, but then a few years later you went back. That's what happened in Great Britain from 1797 to 1821. Um, that's what happened in the United States during the Civil War and, it's, and, 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 and elsewhere, okay, during wars, um, World War I. So the value of money was not purely based on, on, on the supply and demand for fiat money. It was also based on the expectation that, it, whether that was greater or lesser, that you would go back to gold, okay? So that tend to maintain the value of, of paper money. But Rothbard shows that, in fact, we have a system of fiat money, and he shows how it develops in this very short book, clearly written book. Okay, so it's a great contribution there. Okay. All right, now, um, he's not done. He's written, actually, a third volume of Man, Economy, and State, which is too radical, so, they so the um, company that is, is funding him, the... the, the uh, um, Foundation refuses to publish that third volume. They make him cut it down tremendously, take out the anarcho-capitalist analysis in uh, power and market, what, what became power and market, and he um, cuts it down. And so it was only a two-volume man economy state. But he comes out with the full power and market, which was, was to be the third volume, in 1970. Okay, And he gives us an exhaustive typology and analysis of the different types of government interventions, okay, including taxing and spending, and if, that, if you see that as an intervention, then, then you see the free market naturally as being a, a market with competing um, uh, defense agencies. In 1973, he publishes Four New Liberty, okay, a work in libertarian political economy, okay, which presented the first uh, full argument in defense of a purely anarcho-capitalist society, which was grounded on natural rights. Okay. Even though Molinari talked about it, he didn't ground it on natural rights like Rothbard did. And finally, in 1974, he publishes a collection of previously published essays called Egalitarianism, Egalitarianism as a Revolt Against Na Nature. Um, what else has been done? Not much else has been done during this period. Um, Israel Kirzner, um finally publishes in 1973 his influential competition entrepreneurship. Okay? The only other notable work in the Austrian tradition published during this period was The Myths of Antitrust, which was published in 1972, by a very young economist, Dominic Armentano, uh, which was a great Austrian critique of, of antitrust theory. Okay? Uh, Hans Senholtz uh, publishes a number of, of, of great pamphlets and articles 
and booklets uh, crit criticizing contemporary monetary theory and policy. Uh, but it was mainly Rothbard. Now, the rebirth then did not occur in 1974. Why did 30 people come to South Royalton? 30 people came to South Royalton because we were all, to, to the last man and woman, and I think there was one woman there, maybe two, um, we were all Rothbardians. We had read all of these works, okay, that had been the, 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 the fruit of this enormous period of cre creativity that Rothbard had between 1962 and 1974. Okay. Everyone was a Rothbardian. Um, Kersner's book, yes, was very influential, and it was a topic of discussion at the South Royalton Conference, but it had just come out. And it, you know, it was out for a year, and um, everyone looked on it as, well, being consistent with Rothbard, and just being a, a, a critique of the neoclassical microeconomic theory. Um, so, it was 1962, I, I, I mark as the uh, revival of Austrian economics. Okay. Um, now, Rothbard's work inspired many graduate students and, 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 and young members of, um, uh, you know, young faculty members. Right? Um, I was telling some people at lunch yesterday, uh, I was in, in, I was in college um, in, uh, and discovered, you know, the Austrian school, I think, in 1970 or so, 1971. It was a junior in college, and um, I, there was a great article in the New York Times had come out about um, a, 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 the radical alternative, libertarianism, the radical alternative. It was on the front page, this would never happen today, the front page of New York Times Sunday Magazine. Okay? And there were two Columbia pre-law students, law students standing there um, on the front page. They had their fists raised, and they had um, a, red, uh, a black flag behind them. And um, in it, they mentioned, for, I had read Rand, and, and, and um, that was really about it. I, I knew Rand. And I knew uh, when I arrived at college my freshman year, I, I realized that there was a difference between conservatives and libertarians. And it was a sort of a, a, a magazine called, I forget the exact, exact conflict or something. I forget the name of it. But it, it, it was a, a magazine in which you had um, uh, the division talked about. So I, 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 was con I considered myself a libertarian, but I didn't know much about Austrian economics. And I was taking all these, these lousy... Um, you know, macro, I took principles of macro, micro, and then intermediate macro, micro. And then I happened to mention to someone, I read this article in the New York Times um, Sunday magazine, uh, and that they mentioned this, this, this Austrian economist who I had heard, I had heard about the Austrian school in my history of thought class as being Bombavark, Menger, and Wieser. And uh, uh, the teacher was actually a very good professor, and he was very, very excited about, this, about it. He wasn't an Austrian himself, but he says one of the first times in, hi in the history of thought that three such brilliant, such brilliant men had gotten together and worked together on developing, you know, uh, the same uh, uh, paradigm. So I, so when someone, when I read that there's a guy who's an Austrian, I said, "Was he 200 years old?" Um, so I, you know, I had heard. So I mentioned it to one of the conservatives in the Young Americans for Freedom. There was like we, we there were libertarians and, and, and conservatives in this in this um, uh, chapter at Boston College where, that I attended. And, um, and we got along pretty well when we argued. He said, well, he says, here, he says, I have a, a pamphlet. He brought me in the next day a pamphlet. It was called Depressions, Causes, and Cures. So I went home, and I, I, you know, it, it was 30 pages, a small little mini book. And I read it, and it was by Rothbard. And I, I just saw the light. I just realized that you know, all, I learned more in, in reading that in 45 minutes than I did in sitting through all the principles of macro and, 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 and intermediate macro. Um, and so I, I just became, an, you know, overnight I became an Austrian. And so then when I went home that summer between my junior and, and, and senior year, I remember, as I was mentioning, I, I was a janitor. Um, it, was, it was, yeah, there was a depression. It was a recession during that. It was a, it was a stagflation. So there was hardly any jobs. So I had to take a job as a, as a manager, as a janitor. So I, I was, I do my work real fast, and I'd sit in a broom, clo this broom closet with this little light, and I, I just was reading, you know, through uh, America's Great Depression. So I mean, my experience isn't, isn't, uh, you know. I'm not alone in that, okay? All of these people throughout the country who were libertarians and who had discovered the Austrian school uh, were, were, were reading Rothbard on their own or in very small groups. No one knew who, you know, the other existed. So when you did have this South Royalton conference announced, okay, you had people who were already completely grounded 
in Austrian economics, to a greater or less, uh, not, maybe not completely, but to a greater or lesser extent. Okay? By, by, by 1974, I had, I had read you know, Human Action, Price and Production, so on. Most of Mises and Rothbard and, um, and, and Hayek. Okay. And uh, once again, that's, that's, not mo that's not peculiar. That, that occurred th throughout um, the country. Okay, so that was the, um, that's why you, you had these people coming together, coalescing into a, a self-conscious movement in 1974, okay? The rebirth started in 62. Maybe the movement itself, as a self-conscious movement, began in 1974. And then, of course, it was reinforced when Hayek won the Nobel Prize in October of 1974, okay? But without man, economy, and state, without human action, you would not have had the Austrian revival. Okay. I mean, we can do a counterfactual, or even just with human action, without man, one without the other wouldn't have. Well, there would have been no man, economy, and state without human action. In fact, I asked Rothbard once. Um, I said, "Well, before you read Human Action, 1949, you know, he was in graduate school, right?" I said, "What did you know? What?" You know, I knew you were you were a libertarian, but what kind of economics did you hold? He says, "Well, basically, just you know, so I read Alfred Marshall. I knew about supply and demand. I knew price controls were bad." He says, "But you know, really, not much else." He says, "I was really dissatisfied with economics." He says, "I liked when the um, the uh, the institutionalists attacked the uh, the neoclassicals, and when the neoclassicals attacked the institutionalists, but um, you know, there was no, nothing, no positive theory that attracted me." So you know, Rothbard would have been some sort of a, of a, you know quasi Marshallian or something without human action. Um, even though he would have still been a libertarian, of course he was. Um, all right, so now the other point I wanted to make, um, we have a little time here, is what happens is that after this, this, this co coalition of, or this coalescing of, of, of a new Austrian movement in 1974, there are two more conferences run by the Institute for Humane Studies, which, which sponsored the first conference. Okay, in 1975, there's a conference in which young graduate students such as myself give papers, and um, senior Austrians such as um, Rothbard, Kersner, Hazlitt, Hutt, Hayek was even there, Leland Jaeger, and uh, Ludwig Lachmann, they um, commented on our papers. And I actually had, had Hayek comment on my paper, which was, which was really thrilling. And my paper was sort of on international monetary economics, and Hayek wrote a great book on this in 1937. And... Um, the small book, it's called Monetary Nationalism and International Order. In any, in any case, um, so I, I, had, I cited that quite a bit in there, and, and, and the one of the first things he says was, I had forgotten that I made a contribution in this area when he got up. I mean, he had written so much. So, um, no, but in any case, um, what happens then is, uh, then in 1976, there's another uh, co conference at Windsor Castle, in, 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 in Great Britain. Um, and so a couple of books come out. A book comes out of the first conference, 1974. That book comes out, I think it came out in 1975. It's called The Foundations of Austrian Economics. Then uh, a book comes out of the Windsor Castle Conference. I think it's called New Trends in Austrian Economics. So things look like they're going great. But then in 1977, there's a change in what we might call the property base. Okay. Um, the uh, a billionaire Charles Koch begins to donate um, money to to um, Institute for Humane Studies. It, it comes under his influence, and uh, he he helps create the Cato Institute, a think tank in Washington, a libertarian think tank. Um, initially, he's very very friendly to Austrian economics. He and the people that that you know are working for him, um, but they begin to develop a different strategy about how to go about disseminating the ideas of Austrians. And one of those ideas, uh, strategic ideas, is to downplay the radicalism of Mises, okay, and to play up Hayek's contribution. Because Hayek is much more amenable to modern trends in thought. Okay? Hayek isn't a, you know, a rigid praxeologist like Mises is. Um, He's not um, as, as, ra as um, uh, what's, what's the word? I don't want to say rabidly, but he, he's not as opposed to mathematical economics as, 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 as Hayek and so on. 
So there's a number of, of, of conferences now that in which we begin to, 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 to pass the message on to college students. In the early 1980s, I'm, I'm, I teach at some of these. And they have, they have names like Spontaneous Order Conference. And, and, and you don't see and there's a lot of Hayekian topics. Okay. Now, we were told we could certainly talk about Mises and Rothbard. And there's a lot of readings from Mises and Rothbard. But the form changes. And when the form changes, when you try to moderate your message, eventually... What you, believe begin, or what you believe begins to change. So Mises, what I call in my paper this the period of, um, from 1977 to 1986, Austrian economics without you-know-who, okay? And you-know-who was, was Mises. We weren't allowed really to mention his name. Um, they all, IHS also um, begins to, to, uh, to, to promote the work of Lachman. Lachman is, it, it considers himself a radical subjectivist and um, almost to the point of nihilism, okay, where you, he, he believes that economics can't really say anything about the real world. Right? Um, he wrote a very good book on capital theory in 1956, but he became more and more radically subjectivist. And so he's brought over. He's fu he's, uh, 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 funding is, is given for a program in Austrian economics in the late 1970s at NYU, and then Lachman's brought over as a visiting professor Every other semester he comes from South Africa and teaches there. Um, and I point out that now what begins to happen is that you have resources being poured into uh, Kersner's work and um, Lachman's work. Rothbard breaks, has, a, has, a, has a, an ideological break, or not, not so much ideological, a strategic break with the Cato Institute. Cato, by 1983, Cato, Cato Institute is beginning to hire Chicago economists because they're more... Uh, amenable to, to the mainstream, more acceptable to the mainstream. Okay, so he breaks over that. Um, I get involved. Uh, I'm a young faculty member by then. I get involved in uh, an Austrian program for undergraduates at Rutgers University for two years. We, I think we're given twenty thousand dollars a year um, to run programs. We run a massive conference on inflation in 1978, I believe it was, and. The main speakers are not Austrians. I mean, there are some young Austrians, here, such as myself, John Egger. Um, I don't know if Roger Garrison came. But the main speakers are people like Martin Feldstein. Uh, basically, sort of right-wing Keynesians are invited. Okay, uh, and, um, uh, uh, Axel Leyenhofer, who is sort of sympathetic to the Austrians, but is, is, is himself not Austrian, has a very big name. A number of others. In other words, Austrian economics and its radicalism is beginning to be downplayed now. Okay. I'm, you know, I don't know what's going on. And I'm, you know, it's great. You know, these people you know, seem to be free market. Um, you also see the divergence between the three main speakers at the South Wellington Conference. Okay? When the book comes out, if you look at it, you'll notice that on the one hand, Kersner is, 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 is emphasizing the distinction between what he calls a Rabinzian economizer who pur purposefully allocates resources to given ends, ends that he knows, given his knowledge, and what he calls the Misesian actor, who um, is supposedly continually alert and seeking new ends, okay, always seeking for new ends and, and means to pursue these new ends. But if that were true, if, if you, uh, human beings were uh, homo queerens, meaning a seeking man, rather than homo agents, which is Mises' acting man, Mises talks about homo agents being the acting man, um, if, if it's really someone who is continually seeking, they never act. At some point when people act, you must act on the basis of what you know right now and how you rank those values. Okay? You're not continually seeking. Okay? At the moment of action, all seeking stops. Okay? So right now, um, I, let's say at the point where I started to give this lecture, I had been seeking for different ways to present this material. Okay? But whether or not this is the best way to present it, it's the, the, the way that I believe you know, is that at the top of my value scale. So, so Kersner is, is, is moving away from Misesian praxeology. Uh, you can see that in that book. Um, and what's interesting is that Robbins, okay, who, who Kersner criticizes quite a bit at, at the South Wellington Conference, based his concept of choice specifically on, on Menger's economizing man. Okay? Um, now, if... The uh, Mises, I, I found out from Guido Hulsman that Mises' um, uh, German treatise, uh, you know, precursor of, of human action, uh, had a subtitle, The Theory of Action and Economizing. 
Okay? So Mises believed in Mengarian economizing, which is, given your state of knowledge at this point in time, you rank your ends, and you choose those ends which your resources will allow you to choose which are highest. Okay. Uh, then if you look at Lachman's papers, you, know, you can't figure out really what he's saying. He's basically saying... Uh, the market process is ruled by you know, autonomous expectations. People expect different things continually. Uh, these expectations have nothing to do with the real world. Um, they're detached from human purpose, judgment, and property. Uh, the free market is incapable of systematically weeding out bad entrepreneurs over time. Um, I asked him, I said, don't ent I, I went up to Lachlan, I said, don't entrepreneurs have the ability to, um, to forecast what the uh, revenue will be uh, of, on certain decisions? Uh, they make, he says, absolutely not. So, you know, I mean, it means in, in human action, says it's a datum of human action that people have better or worse judgment of the future. We have to take that, we have to accept that. So, you know, so, so Lock, you know, again, I, once again, you know, Lockman was, was a very um, uh, dignified and um, formidable European professor. So, you know, in, initially, I, you know, I accepted what he was saying, as, as many of us did. Okay. Anyway, by 19, um, this is, by 1978, there's a really a headlong retreat from Mises and a prax praxeological paradigm. And um, the split in Austrian economics is pretty open by that point. Um, we had something called the Austrian Economics Newsletter, which I was a member of the Board of Editors on, and Don, the late Don Lavoie. Um, he wrote a review of the monthly Austrian Economics Seminar, which was held at NYU, where Israel Kirzner taught. And in one of the issues of that newsletter, um, he correctly identified two contrasting intellectual tendencies among Austrians, nihilism and Ricardianism. In other words, if you, want to, if you didn't follow Lachman okay, and, and, and become a nihilist, you were, you were a Ricardian, you were an objectivist, which, which was worse. Okay? It's better to admit you don't know things than, 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 than to be an objectivist. Okay? Um, he went on to declare... The modern Austrian school can be, use, can be usefully an, analyzed as the theoretical tool of this nihilist Ricardian spectrum. So the other side, I mean, he's on, he's on the, you know, the, the Kurzer Lachman side. The other side recognizes that, there's, that these two traditions are, are still with us, okay? Or, or now there's a different sort of tradition, okay? Um, then they interview uh, Sh they, Shackle, who was sort of Lachman's mentor in this nihilism, and he. Um, he wrote this book, Epistemics and Economics, uh, which was very influential among young Austrians in the late 1970s. And he, Shackle, in the interview, in the Austrian Economics Newsletter, says the following. He says, um, he admits his approach to economics, quote, is a very nihilistic position, and I realize that, okay? He also says, I've been saying for almost 40 years that economics isn't a science, and we ought not to call it a science, unquote, okay? Um, Finally, he says, my idea of welfare economics is that you choose an administrator, a man with a conscience himself and broad sympathy, with a generous mind, and then you say, leave it to him. What's well, a dictator? Okay, so this is his, this is his welfare theory. Okay. So, um, let me just sum this up so I can get some, some questions in here. Uh, by late 1970, Rothbard is really deprived of, of, of an institutional base. Okay. He's teaching at a small college in Brooklyn. Um, he doesn't have many resources at his disposal. In, in the early 1980s, after he breaks with the Cato Institute, he's really alone. There's no one there uh, you know, to give him um, um, material uh, sustenance. He did, you know, his, his resource base has, has, has shrunk. Um, a second PhD program, which initially, not, not now, but initially was anti misesian pro lachmanian is opened up at, at, at George Mason University in Northern Virginia. Okay, uh, it's not an Austrian program; it's a market process economics program. Okay, so they're again, they're uh, they're they're following a strategic vision of soft peddling Austrian economics. Right. But regardless, because uh, um, Rothbard is a genius like Mises, he continues to write on his own. Comes out with a tremendous number of papers, contrary to what many. Um, uh, Austrians believe um, in the, uh, the uh, accepted version of the rebirth of Austrian economics. Rothbard did not leave economics in the late 1970s. He wrote papers like The Myth of Neutral Taxation, 1981, Law, Property Rights, and Air Pollution, 82, The Federal Reserve as a Cartelization Device in 84, The Case for the Genuine Gold Dollar in 85, 
Uh, the ethic of, Ethics of Liberty comes out in 1982, and The Mystery of Banking uh, comes out in 1983. Okay? So he's continuing to write despite the, his, his deprivation of, of any sort of, uh, of, of, of uh, institutional infrastructure. Okay? Uh, now, this is where the Mises Institute comes in. In 1983, Lou Rockwell um, founds, the, or 1982, he founds the Mises Institute, um, and it's unabashedly inspired by the scientific vision of Ludwig von Mises. Um, he gets together with Rothbard. Rothbard becomes the head of, of the academic programs. Um, they talk about starting a journal, which they, 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 they begin the journal. 1985, I believe, the, the review of Austrian economics is, is begun. Um, there is a boycott. Rothbard asks many of the younger Austrians that he, he's not, he knew, such as Don Lavoie and Larry White and uh, myself and, and others, to be on the board of editors, um, and they're going to name it the Review of Austrian Economics. Well, he gets uh, that's many of them boycott it and say no, they don't want to do it because they want it to be run like a real journal, meaning that it has to, you know, in effect, they don't trust Rothbard to have the articles refereed. Okay. So, um, and, it, and it's sort of a, and I have some of the letters that they wrote, um, because they, they copied me, thinking that I would join a boycott, but I did not. By then, I realized that there was a split in Austrian economics, that, um, that I was a Misesian, and that, you know, that Rothbard was the most important Austrian, uh, econ oh, I always thought that, the most important living Austrian economist at the time. So, um, Lou Rockwell then starts the institute, and um, it's really in 1986 when the Review of Austrian Economics begins that you get um, a real flowering of, of, of uh, Austrian economics. Okay? You have Hans Hoppe uh, coming over in 1985 and, and David Gordon being discovered and um, many others, um, Mark Fortin uh, coming to Auburn to, to, to the Ph.D. program. Now uh, the Mises Institute being at Auburn draws people here. Um, unfortunately, the Ph.D. program was, was abolished a few years ago, but um, the, uh, the um, Austrian movement now is in, is in full bloom, and it continues to grow, we can, and, and, and it grows because of the, the resources and the institutional infrastructure that uh, you know, Lou Rockwell and the, and the Mises Institute has, has, has made available to us. Okay? We would be nowhere as, as, as uh, advanced as we are had it not been for the, the, the Mises Institute, okay? It really rescued Rothbard uh, in the sense of giving him an institutional base and giving him um, an audience uh, for, for his work. Um, very interestingly, there was a big fight over what the name of the, of the journal would, will be, um, and Rothbard stuck to his guns to call it the Review of Austrian Economics, okay, instead of something like, you know, market process or something. Um, let me close with the following. In 1982, Rothbard closed his remarks on the controversy over the journal's name with the following statement. Um, he wrote, at any rate, we have a tough row to hoe in Austrianism in general to rescue it from Lachman Shackle nihilism, Stanford psych uh, pro uh, probababble, okay, because some, some Stanford so-called Austrian economists are talking about probability theory, um, modern philosophy, fuzzy Hayekianism, all this makes a hardcore institute all the more necessary. Okay? And, and we have that hardcore institute here at the Mises Institute. Okay. I'll stop in uh, about 10 minutes for questions. Yes? Do you have any comments on Fee and uh, Leonard Reed and Senholm? Yeah, I, I think... Um, How they contributed to... Uh, Fee, gave Mises, Fee gave Mises an institutional base in the 1950s. I think it was very, very important. Um, Leonard Reed brought people in. See, one of Mises' points that he makes is that it's, it's important for the academics not just to talk to one another or, or to government policymakers, but to reach out to the people. Okay? And, to, um, and, and Rothbard once told me that he was in a meeting when they were talking about um, starting a graduate school at Fee in Austrian economics. We, that never panned out. But Mises kept saying that we, we must, as you know, professors in this graduate school, give talks to businessmen, give talks to, to, to laypersons. That is, communicate to them uh, Austrian economics. Why? Because Mises strongly believed that, that the whole political system and economic system was driven by ideology, driven by the values that people um, ad adopted, okay? and that uh, th this had to be widespread. So I think fee was uh, essential 
in keeping alive in the 1950s the Austrian tradition. And I think the same thing is true with, with um, Hans Senholz. I wrote a little article on him. I think he was an extremely underrated but very important economist. He is a vocational economist who has taught many, many students uh, who have gone on to become um, active in, in academia or in the writing uh, of Austrian economics. Yes? I would also add that uh, he just published six months ago that mm -hmm. series of lectures for Professor von Mises from 1951. Um, did, I, did I get a hold of that? It just uh, you know, Danny, you, uh, yeah. I gave one to Tommy Daniel. Uh, did it just come out now, you're saying? Come out six months ago. What, I have to look and see what. Oh, I, no, I didn't see that. I, well, it's never been in print before. Yeah. No, okay, yeah, I have to take. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to read this it. Okay. Still Thank you. No, there's, no, there's under Richard Ebling, they're still doing a good job. Richard Ebling's a good Misesian. Um, a little more tolerant than I am, but, but you know, very, very good Misesian. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you touched on it briefly, but I was wondering if you could elaborate more on uh, the exclusivity between Gertner. Well, Kersner's seeking man is, is someone that's continually trying to find a framework within which he can act. That is a, fr a new framework of means and ends. Okay? Whereas, I mean, you know, if you follow that through logically, and I'm sure he would say that I'm taking it, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going beyond what he's saying, you would never act. You're always looking for, 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 for better ends to pursue and, and better means to, um, to, to, to um, use to achieve the, the ends you're pursuing. Whereas Mises' acting men are homo agents, uh, we're acting at every point in time. Okay? I mean, time is scarce. We're acting at every point in time. You know, right now, uh, you know, I am choosing the words that, 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 uh, that I'm speaking to you. Okay? I'm doing it very rapidly and maybe not very well. But um, if I sat down and thought more about it, I, I could, well, maybe I could have presented, presented this in a different way. Maybe I could have written something down and put it here and Put it up on on on, on the wall, uh, but but you know, you you in order to act, you must suspend all seeking. Now that's not to say that you can't learn from your actions. If that's what a cursor means, that's okay. In other words, ex post you can make a mistake. You can say, aha, it didn't turn out like I like I thought it would. Um, in, in similar conditions, next time I would do it differently. Um, I would aim at maybe different ends next time. Let's say I, you know, I buy a motorcycle and I, I drive the motorcycle around and after a few near brushes in New Jersey, you don't want to drive a motorcycle, a few near brushes with bad drivers and driving in the rain, I say, geez, I shouldn't have spent that, you know, $10,000 on that motorcycle. All right. Well, if I'm in that situation again, I'll seek to do something else, to find a better use of my money. But the, as Hans Hoppe points out, it's not a controlled experiment. We're never in that situation again, in the exact same situation. So I don't understand. Now I have given. Curzon would not call the, him seeking man. Okay, um, he would call. You know, he would say this is, this is, um, um, this, this is the uh, uh, this is the act of discovery. Okay, um, the entrepreneurial discovery. See, he he, in his economics, he has the entrepreneur as the person who discovers. Okay, discovers opportunities for profit, and then he has these Robinsian automatons the consumers and the resource sellers that simply react to the prices that are offered by the entrepreneurs on output markets and input markets. Okay. Uh, well, I, that, you know, and, and so the entrepreneur it becomes the seeking man. Now think about it. The entrepreneur never loses any money in Kersner's world. Okay. The entrepreneur just reaches out. He sees things that, that other people don't see. So he reaches out and grabs $10 bills that are floating down that people don't see. Those $10 bills represent the difference between the input prices and the output prices. Okay? I don't like that way of looking at entrepreneurship. The, 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 the future revenue, li uh, revenue lies in the future. You have to estimate what that revenue will be. Um, Ludwig, Ludwig Lachman, to the contrary. Uh, make some forecast about it. You have to rank the best uses of your investment capital now. You have to stop seeking at some point. Make a commitment. When you make that commitment, you make it based on your best forecast of the future, which may be wrong, and then you use your investment capital to bid for resources today and then hope for the best. And the better entrepreneurs will find that they earn a profit in the future. Others will learn that, will, will learn that they lost money. Okay? But those circumstances will never reproduce themselves. Okay? 
So I, I'm, I'm opposed to this whole idea of, of, um, of action being really tied up with, with discovery in some sense. It's tied up with choice. It's choosing. And that's what, if that's what Rabinzia Maximizer is, then that's what, what, we, that's what I think must be economics. That's at the core of Austrian economics. I don't like the word maximizer. Okay. I think we're just choosers. Yes? Do you have any idea why Minger just apparently dropped off the face of the earth? You know, he, he got involved in arguing with, with, with the, um, the German historical school. Okay? He got off the track. He was going to write a three-volume treatise. His principles was an introduction to a three-volume treatise on economics. That would have been great. Okay? He wrote two very good theoretical articles in the 1890s after he stopped, you know, after the debate with the historical school ended in the early 90s. Then after that, he didn't, he didn't write much, okay? Um, he retires in 1903, still fairly young, lives until 1921. But Hayek went through his papers, and Hayek said that he just kept writing and rewriting, you know, his economics, and, it, it's, it, and as he got older and older, it just became worse and worse. And so... Um, it, it's almost incomprehensible. It's stacks of papers that he kept rewriting. He never. I don't. I don't know. Okay. Mises somewhere says that Menger and um, and and von Bobrick were both very depressed because they saw the end of Western civilization coming with, with the interventionism and socialism and wars and so on. I mean that may have sapped his productivity. It, it, that Menger's a very interesting case, and you know I'd like to know more about that. There's also, by the way, hints. Or Mises hinted, I, I've heard this a couple of times, that, that Bombavar could have committed suicide in 1914. Um, that, that there, there are hints. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily true. I mean, but, but, um, but he, was, he was depressed. Yes, I think this might be the last question. Yes. Uh, I'm curious, in Schumpeter's Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, yeah. um, you know, he, he says that you know, capitalism can't last. Right. Socialism will come and it will last. He right. Scott that means this is a, you know, a, a calculation problem. Right. Hegelian dialectic. Uh, in, to what extent is Schumpeter really an Austrian in practice, you know, rather than just origin? Um, no, in practice he's not an Austrian. I mean, he is a Volrasian in practice, but he doesn't know mathematics. Um, he's a Volrasian. Um, that's why he believes that 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 prices. If you know the the prices of the uh, outputs. Well, and, 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 you, and you know the, uh, the available inputs, well, then you can ha have these imputed back without an entrepreneur. Okay? So he believes that you can directly impute prices back to the, to, to, to the inputs, which means that you solve the problem of socialism. Okay? There doesn't have to be markets for inputs. There doesn't have to be market, markets for capital goods. They can be collectively owned. Right? Now, um, Hayek criticizes him, but it's not on a Misesian basis. Hayek criticizes him because, you know, all of the dispersed knowledge problem, not because there's no entrepreneur who's trying to appraise future prices and use his forecasts to bid for, bid on the markets for inputs. Okay, that's where the prices of inputs come from. That's where your cost of production comes from. And that allows you to calculate economically. So um, he's, he's an Austrian by birth. But there is strains of Austrianism in, in Schumpeter. There's no doubt about that. Mises and, and, and Schumpeter didn't like each other. When Mises came to the United States, they met once for tea, and his wife said it was very, very frigid. You know, the, the, and, um, but uh, he didn't, um, they didn't, they didn't get along. I think they were rivals in, in, in Bon Bavar's seminar. Okay, I think uh, we can stop here. Okay, thank you.